All right, guys, uh, we're going to start now. Uh, just a quick disclaimer before I start off. I do e you know, get easily distracted. So if you guys are talking, I'll probably want to listen to what you're talking about. So I mean, just stop and hand over the mic to you. No. But uh, you know, uh, we'll try to keep it short and sweet so that we have time for a Q&A at the end of the talk, because I feel like uh, uh, the talks are like an important uh, aspect of, of getting the discussion going. But the most interesting discussion happens when it turns into an interactive session. So we'll try to bear with it. Today, uh, you know, we're going to talk about uh, Cloud Foundry. We'll talk about OpenStack, containers, open source, you know, like essentially everything that you've been hearing about uh, over the last couple of days, stuff that you know you'll be hearing about over the next few days, and uh, and we'll talk about how it all comes together and in a product portfolio, in a product strategy, in a Helion development uh, platform product, and we also have uh, Arun from my team here who'll uh, you know work with me. He'll give a live demo of some of the aspects of the platform that we are going to be showcasing today. I'm uh, Manav Mishra. I'm, uh, I uh, head up the uh, Helion development platform product team. Uh, I have been at HP. I started at HP soon after OpenStack Hong Kong last year, so rough, roughly like 11 months. Uh, I came to HP from Google. I used to lead product management for Google Analytics, and then prior to that, as you'll see from some of the animations in my slides, I used to be at Microsoft, so I know how to use PowerPoint really well. Uh, and uh, and then before that, I used, was an open source developer at Intel. So kind of done the you know tour the industry, and I'm at HP today. See, this is what I was talking about. So so before I start off, like the core, you know, I just wanted to uh, quickly touch upon the core themes of uh, of a developer focused product. So when I started at HP, you know, the, the whole uh, essence of what we wanted to do was to create a product for developers by developers, right? And uh, the core pillars of our strategy are built around what I call the three Ds, develop, deploy, deliver. And I just want to spend like 30 seconds on the slide so that uh, you know, the essence of this message is loud and clear to, to everybody. And if you have questions, we'll do a Q&A uh, about it afterwards. So it's about developing the you know, uh, cloud-native applications, developing cl uh, applications which run on the cloud in an easy, seamless manner. Right? Like, oftentimes, when we think of user experience and usability of a product, we tend to think consumer. We tend to think the, the actual user experience. But uh, when you're building a, a product that's catering to developers, the user experience for developers is the developer experience. And if there is a barrier to entry for developers to start building to your platform, you're not going to attract uh, the mindshare. You're not going to attract uh, the ecosystem, uh, which is key to the success of any platform. So develop is a key pillar. The second one is deploy. Uh, deployment of cloud applications. Uh, you know, for a lot of you work in enterprises, a lot of you work with enterprises. Uh, you know, deploying an application to the cloud in the enterprise, depending on which stage of the cloud journey the enterprise is in, uh, can be a very tiring process, can be a process that may take um, several days, several weeks. And some places, uh, my own first-hand experience, uh, you know, a few months for a small change to propagate all the way to the cloud. So how do we ease the, uh, the deployment of applications? It's the core pillar of uh, what we are trying to do as well. And then finally, deliver. Uh, by deliver, what we mean is uh, you know, we, you know, we are HP. HP, you know, that's a lot of business with, with enterprises. I would, uh, you know, I'm not standing on a limb when I say that HP understands enterprises really, really, really well. Uh, and that's been my learning, you know, since I joined HP. Uh, so uh, when you're building a platform for enterprises, you need to give people a tool to deliver enterprise-grade applications. So unless your platform is enterprise-grade and supports innately the development of enterprise applications, uh, you're requiring the enterprise or the app developer to do extra work to take an application that, that's been developed and make it enterprise ready. So one of the core principles was to have an innate experience uh, which made any application being built to the Helion development platform uh, be enterprise ready, ready from day one. It took more than 30 seconds on this one, but it's very important. So that's why I spent so much time. And cool animation, right? 
So, so I spend a lot of my time on the road talking to customers. Um, all of you do. So uh, everything that I'm going to talk about here should be motherhood and apple pie for all of you. You'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah this is exactly what we hear. Or no, maybe like, you know, you, you're missing a few things here. So bear with me on this. If I'm missing something here, uh, you know, call it out when we actually do the uh, Q&A afterwards. But the key challenges that I hear whenever I talk to uh, enterprises, when I talk to like, people who run sh huge IT organizations, when, when I talk to CIOs and C-level executives in, in, you know, in the Fortune 500 companies, you know, we, HP has a presence in almost every Fortune 500 company, I think all of them, uh, that, uh, that exist today. Uh, the, the key things that I hear are, are the following. One, enterprises have one of everything. There's not a single enterprise out there which is like all, all in on one particular vendor be it a hardware vendor or be it a software vendor. They have, you know, I don't want to use the word hybrid because hybrid is such a, uh, uh, you know, uh, broad term, but it's like a hybrid infrastructure, right? They have different hardware, different vendors, different software, different types of databases, different application development models, different frameworks, <laughs> and it's kind of like a cluster, right? But it is also, uh, uh, you know, a, rep a representation of how the enterprise IT organizations have grown over the last like couple of decades, right? So they're looking for a solution which can span the existing infrastructure. Like no one is going to say, okay, I'm going to burn my infrastructure down and start fresh, right? Like the, the, the Phoenix story doesn't exist in the enterprise. It's a, so any new solution that comes to be has to fit in with the existing enterprise infrastructure. The second thing, is vendor lock-in. Uh, I have, you know, I kind of talked about my history. I've been on both sides of uh, vendor lock-in. I have enjoyed being in a company that uh, loved, uh, you know, uh, being, you know, the, the solution of choice and the only solution of choice. And I'm here at HP building open platforms and open source. So having been on both sides of the table, let me tell you, uh, enterprises do not like being locked in, right? Like they want a solution which ha offers them flexibility, which offers them sort of like a composable stack so that they can pick and choose things that they need and they can leave things that they don't need behind. Very important, very important. And low t total cost of ownership, right? IT organizations, as we know today, have, you know, have a huge uh, you know, capital spend. They are the backbone of the organization. But at the same time, they're also a cost center, right? So, uh, they have, there's a lot of justification for any kind of IT uh, capital spending, but, but at the same time, they're expected to drive the organization forward. So the goals are kind of in conflict of each other, but that's the job of the CIO. So when you meet, meet a CIO, you have to like keep in mind that the guy is probably doing the toughest job that exists in an enterprise today because you have like two conflicting goals uh, which are key to your success, key to the success of the organization. So they want solutions which have low uh, total cost of ownership. So this is where apps come into play, right? Because apps is the atomic entity uh, for interaction, uh, for transaction within the enterprise. Apps are cheap to build, easy to deploy. Apps have the, the maximum touch point with the organization. So think of like payroll or HR or any of the business critical or mission critical supply chain apps, for example, being HP, we understand supply chain really well. Apps is where the transactions happen. App is, apps uh, are where the IT organization touches the, uh, the human beings the, you know, uh, in, the, in the enterprise. And that is where a, a lot of innovation happens. So everybody at the end of the day, you, know, you can build the, the best infrastructure in the world, but at the end of the day, the IT organization is rated on the quality of the apps, the quality of service behind the apps that are run on that infrastructure. And the problem with apps is apps are transforming, right? Like when you think of, of the, you know, the model from the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, we had the three-tiered model of app development, then we moved to the virtualized model of app development. Now we are talking cloud native. So there are different models of app development which uh, are, are, are a reflection of the technology which was, uh, uh, was in prime at that point in time. But today's world, like in today's world, like all the three models coexist. And again, as I said earlier, there's no like magic switch, there's no on and off switch which can make the ID organization move from the world of yesterday to, to the world of today. So any solution that we define, any solution that we create has to support an, a healthy ecosystem where the three different models of app development can coexist. 
And that is where developers come to play, right? Because when you're talking about apps, uh, you need developers and you need enterprise developers to build those applications. But even developers have changing needs. You know, like I started, when I started, when I used to be a developer, everyone followed the waterfall model. And when I left Microsoft, we still followed the waterfall model. And, uh, you know, uh, we did, right? And that, but that was a reflection of boxed uh, software because most of the, most of the uh, software companies were building software that was bundled in a box and you went to a physical store or, and you, you, know, you, you paid money, swiped your credit card and you got the, you know, the box software and you took it home or took it to work. But that model has totally changed. The software delivery model has changed. So as a result, the waterfall model is changing. Like everyone's moving to the agile model, right? Uh, things that web scale companies do today is what every enterprise aspires to do going forward. So like, you know, uh, I, live, I live in San Francisco. So in the Valley, for example, Facebook, Google, where I was for like, uh, you know, for, for a period of time, uh, we used to change applications multiple times a day, right? We, you know, Google Analytics, we would change, we would add features, you know, like once a week, you know, like you know, these were not big, big features, but these were small features, but that's what every enterprise wants to move to. That doesn't mean every enterprise will change the application uh, you know, in real time, like you know, 20 times a week, but they want to have the flexibility again to make to move to that model, to have that option available to them, so that when you want to change a web page, uh, you know, on on your HR website, it's not a two two week cycle. It can be done within hours, if not hours, within minutes. So developers are key, but developers have changing needs. First, developers want to do what they have trained themselves to do, what they have a passion to do, which is to write code. Developers don't care about like deploying clusters and you know, de uh, provisioning a database service or provisioning a messaging service or figuring out how OpenStack works because if they do that, they can do that. Like it's not something that they cannot do, but it's taking them away from their value add to the organization. And the more time a developer spends understanding how cloud works, the less time he or she is spending developing the application that they've been hired to develop. So very important. Second, they want more abstraction. Like just, it's a follow-up point to the, the, to the first one, where the, uh, you know, where it's all about APIs. At the end of the day, you know, like about 10, 15 years ago when, you know, the, when the RESTful API system came to be, like everything, you know, I used to be at Microsoft when we did SOAP. Don't hold it against me, but it was important uh, back then. But, uh, you know, uh, developers like abstraction. They want an API to use to do uh, you know, easy tasks, to do simple tasks. They want their applications to be portable and flexible. Uh, so enterprises have hybrid cloud deployments. They have public cloud, private cloud, managed clouds, depending on, uh, on the scenario, depending on the kind of application they're building. They don't want to be building specific applications for each type of uh, cloud deployment. They want to build it once, and they want to have, the, again, the flexibility to run the application anywhere that makes sense depending on the scenario, depending upon the user, depending on, upon the data that's being trans, uh, transacted. And then finally, they want to use the right tool for the right job. Like, if you ask a developer to build a highly transactional database, likely they would want to use Node. So you cannot tell a, a developer that, hey, I want you to build this application which, which, which has high transaction, and you know, I want you to build it in Python, right? Like, like certain things, the laws of physics, they don't, they don't line up. So you want, again, developers to have the flexibility. You want the platform that you're providing to the developer to be polyglot. You want it to support a variety of languages. And the language choice is uh, dependent on two things. The first thing is the nature of the application that's being built. Like what language, what framework suits the application being built. And the second thing is uh, the familiarity of your developer with, with the language of uh, development. Like you, know, like, you want to give people uh, the choice of picking the language they feel uh, best suits their needs, best suits their experience. So, as a, and then, this is where IT meets developers. So once these applications are developed, you want these applications to be enterprise ready. And what I mean by enterprise ready is, needs to have things like security, compliance, performance, scale, availability, data sovereignty, like, Redundancy, like this list is endless. It goes on and on and on. So these are like features that every application needs, but these are features not every application developer needs to build. 
if the platform su supports these features innately. So this ties back to the whole deliver aspect of our team. You know, we had the three themes, de you know, develop, deploy, deliver. This is where the deliver component comes to play. So we want to offer a platform to our uh, customers which, uh, by which the developers can right up, out of the gate build applications which are ready for the enterprise without having to think about things like scale and high availability or disaster recovery because you want these things to be innately provided by the platform. And open source platforms is a way of, uh, of making that happen. Open source has, you know, like you've heard this probably like in five other presentations since yesterday, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. There's a lot, and people here know open source better than, than like anyone else in, a, uh, uh, in the industry. So, but there are, you know, uh, pros and cons of open source. Um, the, the, you know, the cons of open source, you know, are things that we at HP have worked over the last like decade, decade, decade and a half, given our experience with Linux, uh, given our experience with OpenStack. And we have used that uh, to, uh, to address the concerns that enterprises had. And as you can see, you know, when, when the web came to be, uh, a lot of the web today in the enterprise runs on open source, runs on Linux. And we have been able to move the enterprise forward, address the concerns that they've had with open source by providing support, by providing security, by building an ecosystem, and by maturing the technology, working with the enterprises. If we could do that for the web, we can surely do that with OpenStack. We can surely do that with Cloud Foundry. And that is where sorry, the Helion Cloud Platform comes to play. So Helion Cloud Platform is essentially uh, two products. The first product is Helion OpenStack. People in this room are very familiar with that. Not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, we just released Helion OpenStack two weeks ago. It's, uh, you know, uh, built on the, it's on the Juno release. Uh, you, you know, everyone here understands uh, like how you know HP's point of view on OpenStack. We, you know, this is one of our b biggest bets that we have made. This is one of the uh, the open standards that we are very passionate about. So I'm going to spend a lot more time about the development platform because that's the product we launched the week after we launched Helion OpenStack, and that is uh, what we are, I'm going to cover in this uh, presentation today. So I want to spend some time talking about the Helion development platform. Uh, and uh, so Helion development platform has four components. The first component is what we call the application lifecycle service. The second one is the application services component. The third one is the marketplace. And the fourth one is developer experience. Again, it all, it'll all tie back to the three, uh, three Ds I talked about earlier today. So let's uh, focus uh, quickly on the uh, Cloud Foundry component. So Cloud Foundry, so a point to be noted, uh, Helion Development Platform is not a Cloud Foundry distro. It uses Cloud Foundry in a very interesting and meaningful way, and it brings Cloud Foundry and OpenStack in a very uh, interesting proposition together. So our Cloud Foundry layer uh, you know, is built on Cloud Foundry V2. Uh, it is a polyglot platform. It supports a variety of languages, uh, a lot of JVM-based languages, Node, PHP, Perl, uh, the list is uh, endless. Uh, we are going to be including .NET support in it in the next few months. So we will have a, uh, you know, a truly polyglot platform for the enterprises. .NET, because if you look at, uh, a lot of people have done a lot of service, a service of enterprises, but when you look at enterprises today, a healthy percentage of enterprise developers are also .NET developers, and we cannot leave them behind. There's a reason .NET is uh, prominent in the enterprise today, and any open platform, staying true to the principle of being a platform that offers uh, customers <laughs> choice, uh, should, be, uh, should, ha should be truly polyglot. Also included in the application lifecycle service is essentially, as the name implies, the maintenance of the, uh, and the management of the lifecycle of the application. This means uh, you know, developing the application, uh, deploying the application, running an application, pausing an application, killing an application, stopping an application. The, everything at the application layer is handled by, the, uh, by that component. The next component is actually the most interesting part of uh, the development platform product. It is where OpenStack meets Cloud Foundry. And what I mean by that is, the development platform product includes Trove. It includes, uh, it'll also include other meaningful OpenStack services. You know, Sahara is an interesting example, Murano, 
you know, as the open stack, higher level open stack services mature, they will basically come to re realization in that layer. And what we have done on the Helion team is we have created an integration between Cloud Foundry and OpenStack. So Cloud Foundry ships with its own, uh, own microservices. So Cloud Foundry has its own database service, for example. It's got its APIs, it's got its own service, which runs within the Cloud Foundry uh, instance. But if you had Cloud Foundry uh, running on vanilla OpenStack, then you are not truly leveraging the pow power of OpenStack at the application layer. So what we have done is we have actually plumbed the Trove uh, APIs, the Trove service, to the Cloud Foundry database API layer th through the service broker. So now any application which uses database uh, as a service at the Cloud Foundry layer, by virtue of being written to the Helion development platform, which, is, which works on Helion OpenStack, automatically gets uh, Trove as the database backend. Our version of Trove, the one that we shipped like uh, 10 days ago, ships with, uh, uh, with, um, with MySQL inbox. And since Trove is a control plane uh, uh, based service, any uh, a variety of uh, database distros can easily plug into Trove through uh, connectors. And you, you, know, you guys know this better than we do. So we have extensibility in the platform through Trove. We also uh, did, uh, did a lot of work on Trove to make it highly available and we also built a disaster recovery into Trove. So as of today, uh, our version of the development platform is the only shipping version of Trove with HA and DR uh, built into it. We contributed the work we did back to the community. The PTL of Trove uh, works on uh, Helion, works on the Helion development platform product. Uh, staying true to our commitment to OpenStack, to the community, uh, the work that we did with Trove is now, you know, it will be a, you know, it's available upstream in Juno. Uh, we plan to do uh, similar things with um, messaging and other high-level high services. Application services is also the layer where we see HP software services. So HP has a huge, a you know, huge assets, uh, a huge portfolio of software services like Vertica and Autonomy and Fortify. We see all of them come to realization in this layer as well. So as a de developer, you have a choice between using things in box or getting your own services, or using HP software services. And that is what we want this platform to be. We, we see this platform as a, as a composable platform which brings together services which are of interest to developers, which cater to developers, because the target customer for this platform is the developer. The third component is the marketplace component. It's very important. Like, so I ran product management at Windows a long time ago. My learning, you know, running uh, uh, a product team that worked on a platform which was, you know, the most used platform at that point in time, is that if you don't have an ecosystem, you don't have a platform. Imagine, like, you know, if you don't have, uh, uh, you know, there have been like uh, several examples on, in the on, in, in the phone world where phones have come and they didn't have an ecosystem, and that's why they went away, right? So the same thing applies to the cloud side of business also. If you don't have an ecosystem, if you don't have ISV partners, if you don't have platform extensions being built for you, then you don't really have a platform. You have a product that is by you, that is like populated by you, and that is not open, and that, is not, uh, that doesn't offer the choice and flexibility. That, was, that is one of the founding principles of this product, by the way. So we have a marketplace uh, built on Murano. Uh, marketplace has two components. Uh, there are two uh, types of... Uh, uh, elements that we see uh, you know, come to realization in the marketplace. The first one is the, what I call the add-ins and extensions marketplace. So an example would be we ship Trove with MySQL in box. Say so tomorrow uh, an enterprise or a customer wants to use MongoDB with Trove. We don't include MongoDB uh, for a variety of reasons. Like at least we don't have it in, in, in the V1 of our product. Now through the marketplace, the enterprise can easily get MongoDB as the database of their choice uh, working in conjunction with Trove. So that is the extension marketplace, that's the extens extensibility of the platform. The second aspect of the marketplace is what I call the finished apps marketplace. So now, say you, you, know, you are running the Helion development platform and Helion OpenStack in your enterprise, and you, you want a Drupal-based content management system which one of your ISV partners has helped uh, build and develop, 
and you want that to be available to your employees, so you want that to be available to your internal organizations, and how do you do that is through the, through the apps marketplace. The last component is the most important component of the product, because everything else is great. It makes sense if you understand, you know, if you're a technologist, you know, if you're all about open standards and open source, we can all geek out on this stuff. But at the end of the day, we want developers to be, to be building to our platform. And the way we do that is by focusing on developer experience. The way we do that is by making developer experience a key component of our product. And uh, what we did uh, for the V1, for example, we have an Eclipse plugin, which allows you to build, develop, and one-click deploy applications uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, uh, a cloud of your choice. It could be a staging environment. It could be a production environment. So a developer can actually, you know, a developer using Eclipse can stay within the, uh, within the Eclipse IDE. And without leaving the IDE, can own the whole life cycle of the application. We have a portal uh, for developers. You know, again, uh, we, you know, we call it uh, the Helion uh, Developer Network, uh, by which you can uh, get access to all the documentations, all the APIs, sample apps, sample codes. Uh, you can interact with community, uh, with the community building to the platform. We have, uh, you know, we're working on a CI/CD experience just to enable the agile a development model that uh, you know that enterprises care about that web scale companies have been doing for the last few years and we are going to show a, a, you know a bit of a demo uh, later today uh, on it and uh, this is a key component so the idea is we want to reduce the barrier to entry uh, for developers we want to make it as easy as possible for developers to build to this platform we don't want developers to learn new skills uh, or, you know, or like throw away everything that they know and learn something totally new to build to a platform. So if you're a .NET developer, using a platform you can actually build a .NET cloud native application in a very easy manner. If you're a Java developer, you don't have to go learn the cloud, this you know, magical thing called the cloud. You just have to like focus on doing what you do best and just build your application to the platform uh, using uh, mechanisms and best practices that you have, you know, that you have uh, uh, cultivated over the last decade or so. So that was the anatomy. Uh, uh, we joined, uh, just a little quick note on Cloud Foundry. Uh, I think a lot of you are familiar, familiar with this. Uh, Cloud Foundry, uh, you, know, you know, came out of Pivotal. Um, IBM uh, joined uh, Cloud Foundry uh, after Pivotal, like, l last year. You know, maybe like 18 months ago, roughly 18 months ago, uh, we uh, joined Cloud Foundry earlier this year as a Platinum founding member, and there are seven Platinum founding members today: it's, uh Pivotal, EMC, VMware, IBM, uh, SAP, Rackspace, and us. And uh, we see Cloud Foundry as the uh, the open pl uh, platform, the open standard of choice uh, for enterprises uh, for for the runtime for the platform. And we and I also spoke about the work we have done in uh, in coupling Cloud Foundry to OpenStack because otherwise, what's the point? You know, you can have like two layers, not agno agnostic of each other, and not leveraging the capabilities and the and the uh, and the scale and the and the magic of the uh, of the layers underneath. And Cloud Foundry today has about 50, 60, you know, gold, silver, platinum mem members put together. The foundation we have been working on the foundation over the last uh, few months. Uh, uh, you know, the foundation is, uh, will be soon announced, and we are very excited about Cloud Foundry. And we are mostly excited about Cloud Foundry is because we see Cloud Foundry as a bet, a similar bet to what we did with OpenStack uh, three, three plus years ago. Uh, we joined OpenStack as a platinum founding member. We, uh, you know, con contributed to the OpenStack community. We helped shape the direction of, you know, of OpenStack in some places. Uh, we have five or six PTLs on uh, OpenStack working uh, on the Helion products that I talked about. We want to uh, leverage our experience, our understanding, participating in open uh, communities, in open uh, platforms, and open source efforts, and we want to like, carry that forward into the Cloud Foundry space as well. So yeah, so, so the, the development platform product, as I said, is where Cloud Foundry meets OpenStack. Uh, this is so, uh, this is our core promise of the, uh, for, for the product, and this is something that we truly believe in. And you'll see a lot from us in the Cloud Foundry space uh, going forward. 
So what do I mean by the integration between Cloud Foundry and OpenStack? What do I mean about the binding between Cloud Foundry and OpenStack? I already talked about Trove and the database APIs in the Cloud Foundry layer. That's, a, you know, that's an example. Uh, we, we are going to do something similar in the identity space with Keystone. Uh, the management space, you'll see a demo. What we have done is we have actually uh, integrated the management of the Cloud Foundry cluster into the Horizon APIs so that as an IT admin, who's responsible for the whole cloud, you don't have two different experiences. You can manage Cloud Foundry and OpenStack from the same portal, from the same experience, it's very consistent, it's one product. And because we see IAS and PaaS as one stack, we don't see them as two different products from two different places, agnostic of each other. But there's more. So, yeah. So we also, uh, you know, Docker's containers. These are like you know very interesting topics. Every customer I go, you know, I go talk to, um, you know, brings up Docker and containers, and people keep asking me, what do we mean? You know, uh, what's our point of view on Docker and containers? Uh, so what I, uh, you know, we are very excited about uh, Docker as a container technology. We uh, see um, Docker. Uh, and containers is something which is necessary, but not sufficient. It's just not, you can't just have a platform that only has containers and doesn't, it's totally agnostic of like VMs and the virtualized environment, because going back to my earlier point, enterprise, enterprises have a lot of legacy. They have one of everything, and they want something, you know, when they introduce something new into the, into the infrastructure, they want something that fits in with, the, with their existing investments, because no one's going to throw away the investments over the last like decade or so and move to something totally new overnight, unless you're an enterprise which is just coming to be. So uh, our V1 of the development platform uh, uses uh, Docker containers as the deployment mechanism for the Cloud Foundry applications. So Cloud Foundry V2 uh, innately supports a container technology, which is not Docker. Uh, it's sort of the Pivotal's homegrown LXE-like uh, container technology in Cloud Foundry v3, codenamed Diego, which is going to happen sometime next year, uh, Cloud Foundry is formally embracing Docker as the container technology. Uh, a product which, which, we, which we shipped like 10 days ago includes Docker today. So that's one of the things that, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, you know, is are embracing Docker as a container technology of, uh, of choice for Cloud Foundry applications. Uh, <clears throat> we launched the product like on the 23rd of October in San Francisco, and we also had an announcement then, which was uh, we formally joined Kubernetes uh, as a member. Uh, so we are working with Google and the other with the Kubernetes community around container management, and uh, we, we see Kubernetes and container management as an interesting emerging technology, and we are going to participate in it. And our first contribution to the community was. Uh, a, a setup utility that would allow a, anyone to uh, set up Kubernetes on top of Helion OpenStack. And that uh, ut utility, if you want to try it out, is available on GitHub. Like, come find me after this talk and I can point you to it. Uh, we are excited about both Docker and Kubernetes as emerging technologies, and we see them, again, uh, being a composable platform. We see them as interesting elements of the platform going forward. So that said, I think I'm going to move to the demo now. Aaron? You all set? I think so. Let's see. Switch over here. On the mic, or I don't know. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. I think so. Okay. If I start mumbling, can you let me know? Or and monitor for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I will let you know. Okay. Bye. So, um, you know, when we talk about develop and deploy and deliver, it kind of makes sense to actually walk walk through it backwards. And what I mean by that is, uh, what I want to do is walk you through some of the services that we use to deliver enterprise-grade applications, talk about how they tie into the application uh, lifecycle service, and show how we deploy and, or how we deliver and deploy applications within that service. So just a quick uh, interjection here. So this is our live product that we just launched 10 days ago. You know, hopefully the demo gods will be on our side today. They've, they've been like pretty good so far, so don't want to jinx it. But this is actually like the Helia developing platform running, running on our public cloud. And this is like live bits. There's nothing staged about it. So if it works, you know, you know like uh, appreciate it. Uh, you know, appreciate the, the demo gods. And if it doesn't, just bear with us because it is live. 
And uh, you know, Wi-Fi has been interesting all day today. So if we have long pauses, Mono has promised to do his best mime impressions. Yeah, sorry about things. Yeah, I'm good at that. That's my value add. So our database service, again, is an implementation of Trove. And what we offer in the database service is the ability to create an instance, to create a master-slave pair, to back an instance up, start, stop instances. Um, you know, all the things that, as a developer, you really don't want to think about probably end up more time thinking, uh, you know, doing that stuff than you really want to. We wanted to provide this, uh, this level of service uh, and allow you to easily create databases within there that you could, you could then just sort of manage uh, as needed. So what I'm specifically talking about is, you know, within this, uh, I'm showing you the database panel within the Horizon UI. And if I wanted to create a database, I could do it in a bunch of different ways. There's <coughs> the standard you know, create options of what size, what volume size. Right now we support MySQL 5.5. Um, there's also the ability to restore it from a backup that you may have scheduled with this service, as well as create a slave pair. And if, and, and if you were to create a slave from a master, if you were to replicate from an instance, you would land that in a different availability zone. And so out of the box, we're giving you high availability of a backing service. When we talk about the messaging service that's in beta. Uh, you know, Cloud Foundry actually offers uh, RabbitMQ connection, but it's a single node. It's kind of a toy connection, and it's unmanaged. What we're trying to do here is provide the, bare, the, the essentials of a managed service. Um, unlike Cloud Foundry, what we actually have here is the ability to launch uh, nodes of RabbitMQ clusters. And so the multiple, you know, if, as we launch a three or a five node cluster, those are deployed across availability zones. So again, you get better availability and a higher level of management. You can also actually, one, one key thing about this is um, that Rabbit is actually integrated with Keystone. So since I created some of these clusters, I'm, um, you know, my authentication into those clusters is actually built in and I can add other people <coughs> that are in Keystone as well. Yeah. And just for context, Arun is channeling his uh, inner IT admin right now when he's interacting with this UI. I am. I am, so I'm gonna maybe flip, uh, flip a switch soon. But I wanted to actually talk about uh, application lifecycle service. Um, you know, that's our implementation of Cloud Foundry. And clicking on the power, great. Um, what, we, what we've enabled within the application lifecycle service is the ability to easily instantiate Cloud Foundry clusters, um, easily integrate our managed services <coughs> that I just walked th through up into those clusters, and easily manage applications from within those clusters. I'm gonna walk through all of that. So when I, if I was to go through and create a cluster, um, I can actually use some of the services that I just walked through, the database service specifically, uh, at creation time. I can choose to actually create a new managed database instance or I could actually use an existing one. So you'll see that these are the, these are the database instances that, were, that I've actually created that are highly available. So right at the bat at creation time, I actually get a database service that I can bind to that is managed. And by managed, you mean it's uh, got high availability. Yep. HA and D are built into it. That's right, that's right. Um, if we go into one of these clusters, um, what we have here is a UI experience. And so the UI experience is really built around making these applications really easy to manage. And what I mean by that is if we click into one of these, the first thing I can do is I can actually enable auto scaling. So, um, you know, I can set a policy about when I want my the instances of my application to scale in or out, and I don't have to worry about that as a developer. I don't have to pre-configure it or do some kind of scripting. It's built right into the platform itself. And so it can be conditional. Yeah, it can be conditional. Yeah. So, right now what I'm doing is I'm setting the thresholds at which I would scale up and down. So I would scale down at the lower threshold and I'd scale up at the higher threshold and I've also set the instances that I would scale out to. I can also see the log stream of this application in real time and this is really useful if I make a mistake and things don't go well at deployment or if I just have a bug. Uh, I can also easily uh, synchronize or collect this in a central logging service. So those are the kind of the management things that you know normally I'd have to stitch together um, and that I get for free as part of the platform. The other thing that, that this platform really gives me is the ability to deploy right now from my laptop up into the cloud. And that's 
that I think is really cool. You're the, you're the developer. All right, right, I've switched. Right. switched. I'm now the developer. Um, and so what I've got here is a very simple application that I've written. I'll show you. It's, it's very simple. Actually, it's just a bunch of files. Uh, it's a node application. It's a chat application. And if I wanted to actually push this version out, I would use our healing command line tool. And this tool actually asks me a bunch of questions uh, to help guide me through the process. Eventually, when it wakes up. So, I'm gonna choose to deploy from uh, the 15 net. And what that does, what I'm doing now, what it does for me is actually basically build a domain for me. I've got a couple more sort of default questions. going to not find any services. And now the deployment starts. So it's actually packaging the application up and uploading it up to the cloud. And then you can see here, it's actually stopping the application out there and starting it. I can go to the app panel and let me get up to this application, which is a different one. And you can see it deploying here. So what you're seeing is there's a bunch of sort of deployment, uh, I guess, housekeeping going on. I'm pulling in dependencies at real time uh, from external. Now I'm actually instantiating the service, uh, loading it up, making sure it runs all the way to, sorry, it's going the other way, uh, close to success. So I want to check that. And it looks like it just finished. So if I go over here, got a very simple node uh, chat application that, you know, I can be like the only person chatting in. You love to do that, by the way. Yeah, I talk a lot yeah. to myself. Um, and well, the thing I, I don't thing like I noticed, the background, though. Yeah, I know. The, the thing I noticed when I put this together this morning was that I figured that Monog wouldn't like the background because it's very particular. So uh, I did this on purpose. I see. Try to, try to stay calm with it. So what I'm going to do now, actually, is make a fix, a very simple fix. I'm just going to change the backgrounds here uh, to just sheer black. And there was another one. Oh, there it is. I'm going to save it. But you know, because, because I know Mono is really particular and because I want to actually comply with our dev team's best practices, I actually want to push this up to, to GitHub because I want this change to stick around. So um, the nice thing about the command line, the healing command line, is that I can actually tie it into uh, CI processes. So one of the devs on our team, Fani, is built. Oh, right here. Right here. That's right. If things so go wrong. If it doesn't wrong, work, you know who I'll be looking at. Right. Has built a CI mechanism. And I've actually uh, added my repo in, this node chat repo. What I'm going to do now is, is uh, let's see. I'm going to actually add, I'm going to actually check in that style sheet change. <coughs> I'm going to push it. So, what I'm doing right now is I've actually made a change. I've checked it in. And our prototype CI uh, application is going to actually pick that up. If I go and I drill into this, <coughs> I can see that it's actually starting to build. So this application that you see is actually running on the Debian development platform uh, hosted on a public cloud. So we are using a CI CD uh, application control and manage the CI CD process for other applications being built on the same platform. It's kind of a, kind of a way, it's a very meta, but uh, you know, we were like, hey, we have to build a CI CD experience. We just, you know, we have to use our own platform. We have to eat our own dog food. And uh, this is what we have up and running today. Right. So, so far the demo guys have been smiling. But, oh, there we are. Oh, and then there's that. Sorry about that. Um, you can see here that we're going through the same kind of uh, building and staging stuff that you saw on the command line. And when we actually go to the <coughs> cluster, we can see
see that we're um, deploying as well. So I'm going to refresh this screen as well. And what I've basically done is by, by checking in my code, I've kicked off a build chain that deploys all the way back out to the cloud. And so occasionally we get a bit of a refresh, but let's see if this works. There it is. So it looks like it actually got all the way through. Let's check. Yes, and the color's fixed. And just because Mono's particular, I just wanted to make sure that the color was fixed in the second channel. Oops, sorry Mono, I blew it. Uh, I'll do that <laughs> offline, but just to show you that you know we can go through an entire uh, kind of check-in and deploy cycle, that it's really easy to automate how we actually deploy things, um, and that the platform is actually taking care of a lot of the concerns that I would normally have to either script by hand or work with a large team to get in place. <coughs> and, and, and like just to add to Aaron's point, it, you know the CI/CD experience that we're talking about uh, today exists in web, web scale companies, it exists in like the pub public cloud environments. Enterprise developers <coughs> do not have access to that today. And uh, you know, OpenStack, uh, you know, the web platform, uh, you know, on-premise cloud being such a core integral uh, you know, component of, uh, of our customer base, uh, getting this experience to our enterprise developers is, uh, is, a, is a huge uh, feature. It's a huge win for not only for Cloud Foundry, it's all, but also for OpenStack because the way we see uh, the Helion product line come together is. Uh, Essentially, magnifying the scale and the uh, you know the, the greatness of OpenStack at the application layer. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Oops. And uh, so the Helium develop de development platform, as I said, it's agnostic of the cloud deployment that uh, you know uh, that the enterprise may have. We see that as a software stack that can work in private cloud, public cloud, managed cloud. It's open source, it's an open platform built on two uh, great open standards, uh, no, OpenStack and Cloud Foundry. It's available for download today. We have a community version that you can actually go download and install. It's optimized for Helion OpenStack, so in order to like download the web platform, you'll also need the Helion OpenStack uh, 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 layer uh, to, to enable some of the, the, the greatness of Probe and other uh, services we talked about. And for those in the US, we also have a free uh, dev trial version available for uh, for the developers. So it's a 30-day trial. You can log into uh, it's free. You can log into a, a public cloud. You don't need to set up anything. Within five minutes, you can be up and running, and you can take it for a spin. So that's it. Uh, I'm Manav at hp.com. Uh, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, my Twitter handle is over there. And if you want to learn more about the product, here's my URL. I'm not going to read it. It's too long, but you guys can uh, you know find us. Just search for Helium Development Platform, and you can read this URL. That's it, I'm going to end with my cool slide again, and I'm ready to take questions. Build packs, and we support a, a bunch of Heroku build packs, for example. You can build applications 